sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a forgery detail. Two men have been passing bad checks in your city. You have descriptions of both of them. You know the names on the checks. Your job, get them. First, we read you the six months report. Then the eight months report. Now, here is ten full months of scientific evidence on smoking Chesterfields. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over ten years. After ten full months, almost a year now, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. And Chesterfield is the first and only premium quality cigarette throughout, in both regular and king size. Fine tobaccos, the world's best kept tasty and fresh, wrapped in the finest cigarette paper money can buy. Yes, everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette. And it's the only cigarette that gives you scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfield today. They're best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 8th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welsh. My name's Friday. We were on the way back from the main jail, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to room 29. Forgery. Well, that wraps that one up. Yeah. When are we going to rain him? Oh, figure day after tomorrow. Okay. Well, let's get started on these other crime reports, huh? Yeah. Friday? Smith? Yeah, Skipper. Hi. See you a minute. Sure. Sit down. What's up, Skipper? How's the Clemens thing going? Well, we just talked to him. Says he'll plead guilty. Mm hmm Well, I want you to take a look at this. Okay. Oh, border checks, huh? Yeah. I want you two to go to work on it. Are we going to work with Saunders and Bowmey on it? I want you to take it over. Well, is there a case in it? Yeah, but we got a call from San Francisco last night. They got Richards up there. Oh? At least they know he's operating in the Bay Area. Saunders and Bowmey left last night. They've been on that one for the last year. Looks like they can clean it up. They get back for you, bust this, they'll give you a hand. Well, what's the pitch on it, Skipper? It's all there. Let's take a look, huh, Joe? Mm hmm. Sure, a bunch of paper. Here's we can figure they've been working a little over a year. Yeah. All the checks are drawn on big companies here. You any idea where they're getting them? No, not yet. How far we got on it? Saunders and Bowman have been working on it. They got about halfway through the list of print shops in the city, and then this thing up north came up. Mm hmm. Let me see some of the checks. Oh, yeah, Joe. Sure, here. We got rubber companies, oil companies, department stores. Aircraft. Plants. How about the ID when they pass them? It works. Driver's licenses, social security cards, lodge cards. Looks legit enough. Been a lot of people taken. Descriptions always match, do they? Close enough, yeah. Now and then there's a little difference, but they all match up close enough. Still using the same bad border. Uh huh. You notice that even though they change the name of the company on the check, change the heading all around, they use the same border on all of them. Yeah, I see. Look, there in the lower left hand corner. See? Yeah. Plate's broken. Little break in the border. Mm hmm. All the checks they pass have the same thing. Yeah, well, you wouldn't notice it unless you're really looking for it, would you? Well, that's it. All the reports are there. Everything that's been done, it's in your lap now. Need anything, let me know. Right. Okay, Skipper, we'll get right on it. Well, from the package here, sure looks like they're scoring good, doesn't it? How much they gotten? Well, let's see. Figures about $70,000. Huh. All the bulletins we put out. Know the people you cash checks for. Yeah. 70000 It's a lot of money, isn't it? Sure is. Those people that just read those bulletins. They never learn, huh? 10.02 a.m. We started through the package. 
The check forgers had been working for over a year. They'd passed phony checks all over the southern part of the state. The amounts on the checks varied from $50 to $275. They carried 10 different endorsements. The names and signatures had been run through our files, but we'd gotten no identification. The writing had been checked by Don Meyer, but there were no examples in the files that matched. During the next two days, we finished canvassing the print shops in the area in an attempt to find where the bad checks were being printed. We came up with no new information. Additional circulars were gotten out to all stores and check cashing agencies in the area, giving the description of the two men and lists of the companies the checks had been drawn upon. Photographs of the checks pointing out the border defect were also distributed. Two weeks went by, no results. Informants had been checked and rechecked. Known forgers had been questioned. The victims of the forgers had been shown the mug books. They failed to make any identification. From what they'd told us, we had the artist in the crime lab draw up a composite picture of the two men. Copies of these were distributed to the people and organizations most likely to cash the phony checks. Lieutenant Saunders and Sergeant Bomey finished their investigation up in San Francisco and joined us in the search for the forgers. Tuesday, April 27th, 10.14 a.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. Lousy thing. Yeah, clutch was out. You know, I thought it was a pin. Sure felt like it. Funny feeling when you press down, there's nothing there. Yeah, did he say when it would be ready? Well, I thought he could have it for us in the morning. I'll check the business office and get another car. I mean, we'll try to get a good one. The last one we drew was about to fall apart. Yeah. I'll get it. Forgery, Friday. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, that's right. What? Uh-huh. What was that address again? Yes, ma'am, I have it. Yeah. Yeah, well, do everything you can. Yes, ma'am. Right away. I'll get your coat. What is it? Check cashing agency out on Pico. The guy's there now. Frank and I left the office and checked out another car. We drove out to the check cashing agency on Pico. It was located near a large tool and dye plant, and they advertised that they cashed payroll checks. 10.33 a.m. We parked the car and went into the store. You the police? Yes, ma'am. Are you the one that placed the call? I sure am. I stalled him, like you said. That's him back there. Uh -huh. I told him that he'd have to wait for the manager to get back and open the safe. He got pretty huffy about it at first. Then he said he'd wait. I think he's been drinking. Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll talk to him. He's the one. You'll see. I spotted him right away. Took one look at him, and I knew he was the one you've been looking for. All right, ma'am. Let's go. Sure fits the description. He's the one. Excuse me. Yeah? You wanted to cash a check, did you? Yeah, that's right. What if we could see your identification? The young lady has it. Mm, here it is. His driver's license and his social security card. All right, thank you. Leslie P. Bergen, is that right? That's what it says. Yeah, we've seen it before. Mm -hmm. What if we could see that check? You please? bet. I'll get it for you. Well, look, there's no reason to make a federal case out of this. Give me the check and I'll go someplace else. I tell you, though, you act like this to everybody who comes in here, you ain't going to stay in business long. Yeah. Here you are, officer. Here's the check. What's she talking about? What? Officer. She called him officer. What are you, cops? You called it. How about it, Joe? Yeah, broken border. Hmm. Where'd you get this check, mister? Well, what do you mean, where did I get it? They gave it to me at the plant. Gave you this check, huh? Yeah, that's right. Say, what's this all about, anyway? How come you guys are so interested? I wonder if we can see what you got in your pockets. No, I don't have to show you. It's none of your business. You've been drinking, mister? None of your business. You got no call to act like this. All right, this. come on. Let's see what's in your pockets. Well, what's that going to prove? Now, look, Bergen, if you haven't done anything wrong, then you got no reason not to show us, have you? Yeah. Oh, all right. Put the things here on the counter. Huh? All right. Mm -hmm. You guys can regret this, you know. Is that right? You just bet. I got a lot of friends in pretty high places, and they're going to hear about this. You guys be sorry you ever started this. Uh -huh. All right, come on. You can go a little faster than that, can't you? All right, here. Here's some keys, chains, money clip. All right, pick up the money and keep that with you. Now, just the money. Now, the back pockets. Back pockets? That's right. We want to see what's in them, too. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, all righty. I'm glad to cooperate with the law. Nice to know you guys are this alert. I'm glad to know you're doing your duty. Yeah, come on. Let's get to those back pockets, shall we? Say, what's your name? Friday. Cop, huh? That's right. Friday, huh? Yeah, what's your first name? Joe. Joe Friday. That's right. Now, come on. Get the stuff out of your back pockets, will you? Stall long I bet up. you think I'm trying to hide something in there, huh? Well, you're wrong. I got nothing to hide. There's my wallet. Boom. That's all. This key here? Yeah. Keys to your car? Uh, no, I don't have a car. Well, that's not true, officer. I saw him drive up. That's his car out in front, the red Ford. Isn't that right, Bergen? Well, now, maybe it is, and then maybe again it isn't. You want to check on it, Frank? Yeah. Here's the key. All right. I hate to think of it. I really do. What's that? Trouble you guys are going to get into when my friends in high places hear about this. Yeah, sure. Let's look at your wallet, huh? Why, uh, you bet. 
Oh, we're glad to cooperate with the law. No, you hold it. Just open it up. Any money in it? I told you the money's in the money clip. Right here, you told me to keep it. You don't remember very well, do well, you? These your cards here? Business cards? Uh, let me see. Uh... Here. Yeah, certainly. They're mine. Leslie Paul Bergen, business advisor. I thought you said you worked at the plant. Our time job. What's your name? Friday. What's your first name? Joe, I told you. Joe Friday, huh? I'd remember that and tell my friends in high places. How about your coat pockets? Anything in them? Well, cigarettes, maybe a handkerchief, some matches. That's about all. All right, let's see them. All righty. Sure nice to know that we got officers like you always doing your duty. Yeah, see? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Where'd you say you got this check? What check? This one here, the one you tried to cash. Oh, yeah, that check. Yeah, that check. That's the one. Well, I got it from a friend. Uh, he asked me to cash it for him. Just so happened I had the money, so I did. Anything wrong with cashing a check for a friend? How come the check's made out to you? They always make checks out to me. Always do down the plant. Now, look, mister, you got your stories all mixed up here. Let's go downtown and get this thing straightened out, shall we? Joe. Yeah. We hit it. 23 checks all made out to him. Found him in the glove compartment of the car. The car's registered to a Leslie R. Doyle. What's his name? Smith. First name? Frank. Frank Smith. What is this? No, he's a happy drunk. Oh. These checks yours, Doyle? Well, let me see. Never saw those in my life. Well, we found them in your car. Oh, I certainly don't understand that. In my car? Yes, huh? that's right. Now, come on, let's go downtown. Where are we going? Downtown. What's your name? Smith. Frank Smith. Phony name. You wait till my friends hear about this policeman using your alias. My friends are going to hear about this, you know. Yeah, sure. Ah, in high places. 10.57 a.m. The suspect admitted that his true name was Leslie Doyle and that the car belonged to him. We took him to the city hall. Frank ran the name through R&I, but we got no make on him. His prints were rolled, but there was no record on him. A communication was gotten off to George Brereton, CII Sacramento, and one was sent to Washington. 11.30 a.m. We took him to the interrogation room to question him. I told you, I don't know where the checks came from. They were found in your car. So they were found in my car. That mean they're mine? Looks like you had something to do with it. They all were made out to you, the phony ID you got there. Well, maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's somebody's idea of a gag. Well, huh? that's not very funny, is it, Doyle? Well, you don't have to tell me. Say, you got another aspirin. My head's coming apart. Frank, you got Yeah. It. Here. Yeah, thanks. Got some water? I'll get some for you. No, never mind. I'll take it without. I thought you might have a tap here. What? Sure. You turn it on and let it drip, and then you don't give people none until they answer your questions. Yeah, sure. You take pills like I do, you get to the point where the only important thing is to get them in your stomach. All right. Now, how about the checks, huh? I told you a hundred times I don't know anything about them. Then maybe we better fill you in, huh? Yeah, go ahead. I like to hear. We got you for trying to pass a check this morning, didn't we? You want to cop out to that? So maybe one check. Like I said, that's no crime. I cashed it for a guy. Maybe it was the same guy who applied to the other ones. Oh, why car. don't you come off it, Doyle? Let's stop playing games here. We made you for the forgeries, and you know it. Your description matches the one we got. You turn up with 23 checks made out to you, all drawn on different companies. The border on the checks matches the ones we're looking for. We got witnesses who identify you. Now, why not save a lot of time and admit it? Come on, Doyle. Doyle? Don't look like there's any other way, does it? Not from here. Hmm. Well, if I cop out, will it help any? What do you mean? Like you said, now let's stop playing games. Will it help me out any? You're liable for 1 to 14 on each count. And if I help? All we can do is see that it's marked down that way. That's all? That's all. Well, then I got nothing to lose by not talking. That's the wrong way to look at it. You guys haven't come up with any other way. We don't make deals, Doyle. You know that. Well, all right. I'll play it that way, too. Now, let's get this 510, huh? Your true name, Leslie Richard Doyle? Yeah. Charge, suspicion, 470 PC, forgery, April 27. Where do you live, Doyle? I told you once. Well, tell us again, would you? 19,540 North Edge Hill Avenue. Is that a private home? No, it's an apartment. What's the number? Say, so you got another aspirin. This headache's the worst one I ever had. Don't worry, they're going to get worse. We continued to talk to Doyle. He told us that he'd come from back east about a year and a half ago. He said that he'd never been arrested and he had no record. He refused to tell us who his confederate was in the forgery operation, and he told us that we'd get no help from him in proving that he was mixed up in it. We booked him at the main jail, and then we got in touch with Lieutenant Saunders and Sergeant Bomey. Together with them, we arranged a special show-up. The victims of the forgers were asked to be present, and 12 of them gave us a positive identification of Doyle as the man who'd victimized them. The others said that he was not the man. 
When confronted with this information, Doyle confessed to being one of the men involved, but he still refused to name his accomplice. A week went by. Each day, we questioned Doyle. Gradually, we pieced together a picture of their operation. Doyle still refused to tell us where we could find his partner. The kickback from Washington and Sacramento arrived, but gave us no new information. All known friends and associates of Doyle were checked out. From them, we found out that Doyle did work with another man, but that none of the witnesses could identify him. The rumble was that the two men had split up because of Doyle's drinking. We were able to get little other information on the missing partner. Wednesday, May 5th, 11.40 a.m., Frank and I checked into Captain Welsh's office. How about it? No, nothing, Skipper. He says that he knew Doyle, but he doesn't know the other man. Any of the other leads pan out? No, none of them. Hmm. Where do you go from here? Well, talking to Doyle's friend, we found out they used to hang out down around Wilshire and Olympic. You know that area down here? Yeah. Well, Frank and I have been talking it over. Looks like about the only way to bring him out is to go looking for him. Yeah, so you guys go down there, huh? Well, we checked on that. The bunch down there aren't too chummy. They don't talk to strangers much, so we figured that maybe the best idea would be for one of us to go undercover. Maybe pose as a thief, buy our stolen goods, something like that. We might get a line on them that way. Yeah, might work. Well, not much choice now. We've tried about everything else. Well, which one of you is going to do it? Well, I thought maybe I'd be the one. No, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Why not, Skipper? Joe took the last one. Yeah, but didn't you work that area when you were in Vice? Yeah, but that was a couple of years ago. Still might be some people down there who remember you. You better take this one on Friday. All right. When do you figure to start? I thought in the morning. Okay, work out the way you're going to keep in contact. All the details will give you the help you need to swing it. Right, Skipper. I don't know, Joe. Seems like you're always the one to draw this duty. Ought to be my turn sometime. I'll trade with you. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Smokers all over America are changing to Chesterfield because Chesterfields are premium quality throughout in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There's absolutely no difference except that king-size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. So remember, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. First and only cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king-size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> Thursday, May 6th, 9.30 a.m. I left my apartment and went down to the vicinity of Wilshire and Olympic. I spent an hour wandering around the bars in the area, and then I checked into a small hotel down on South Hill. I registered as Joe Kelvin from Phoenix, Arizona. I told the clerk that I was in town on business and that I'd be there as long as it took me to conclude the deal I was working on. I spent the afternoon in a bar on 4th Street, and I got friendly with a bartender. I asked him if he knew Leslie Doyle, and he told me that he'd seen him around, but that he didn't know him very well. I asked if he'd ever seen Doyle with another man. He said that he had, but he didn't know who he was. The bartender went on to say that the two men had frequent arguments and that they usually ended up with the other man walking out and Doyle going on a drunk. He told me that I might be able to get some additional information on the man in a cafe over on 5th Street. I spent the next three days wandering around that area eating my meals in the restaurant. At the end of that time, I had no new leads. Frank, Saunders, and Bomey were still working on the case and Frank told me that the bad border check passing was still going on. Further conversations with Doyle netted them nothing. At the end of a week, I'd gotten to know one of the waitresses at the restaurant, and she indicated that she knew Doyle's partner, that she knew him merely as Mac. She was unable to tell me where I could find him. I got in touch with Frank Smith, and he ran the name through the moniker file on r and I, but he got no make. Friday, May 14th, 10.56 a.m., I stopped for breakfast. Morning, Joe. Hi, Agnes. Will it be this morning? Well, let's see. Uh... Orange juice, couple of eggs, toast, and coffee. Is that right? Eggs sunny side up? Yeah. How's the bacon? Great, just like always. All right, a couple of pieces. Yeah. Want to bring the coffee right away? Yeah. Is that the morning paper? Here. Yeah. Thank you. What happened to the sports page? Here. You don't look good this morning, bad and I? Yeah, I had trouble getting to sleep last night. Mm-hmm. How's the deal coming? Oh, all right, I should line it up in a couple of days. What business are you in, anyway? Oh, you could call me kind of a broker, I guess. 
that right? Yeah. Coffee's good and hot. Yeah. Just what does that mean? What, the coffee? Being a broker. Oh, I buy things for a price and I resell them for more. Things you buy, they hot? Well, why do you ask that? Just wondered. Rumbles around that you're in town buying stolen stuff. Is that right? That's what they say. Is it true? I don't know. I haven't been talking to the same people as you. Is that the reason you want to get in touch with Mac? Well, look, if I answer that, I've answered the first question, haven't I? Yeah. Is that the reason, Joe? Oh, it might be. Where's the sports page? Is it around? Why, do you know where I can get in touch with him? I like you, Joe. Yeah, well, I think you're nice, too. I'd like to have the sports page if you could find it for me. No, I mean it. I think you're all right. Well, thanks, Agnes. That's nice of you to say that. You've never tried to get fresh. Different from most of the guys that come in here. Is that right? Sure. Guys all the time getting fresh asking me out. Not you, Joe. You got a girl in Phoenix? Oh, I might have, yeah. I haven't been back for a while, you know. Mm-hmm. Lucky girl. What's she like, Joe? Who's that? Girl in Phoenix. Oh, I guess she's a little like you. She's a nice girl. You want to get married? Well, I don't know. It kind of depends on this deal here I'm working on. It'd be nice if you got married. I'm going to get married someday. That'll be nice. It'd be real nice if you got married. Depends on this deal, huh? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I'll tell you how to get in touch with Mac. 11.14 a.m., I continued to talk to Agnes. She told me that she didn't know where Mac lived, but that she could put me in touch with a man who might. She gave me the address, and I drove over to the place. It was a rooming house on South Vermont. I talked to the man. He told me that he'd seen Mac during the past week, and that as far as he knew, the suspect was still living in an apartment house on 7th Street. 1.15 p.m. I called the office and Frank Smith came out to meet me. We arrived at the apartment house and talked to the manager, Mrs. Nancy Holmes. She told us that she had a tenant named McLean who answered the description we gave her. She told us that McLean had lived in the apartment for the past eight months. She went on to say that she didn't know what business he was in, but that up until a few weeks ago, he was in the company of a man called Doyle. Her description of the man matched that of the suspect. 2.46 p.m. In the company of the manager, we went through McLean's apartment. We found 14 checks made out to him, and all of them drawn on large companies. All of them had the same broken printed border. Frank and I waited for him to return. 5.32 p.m. What are you doing here? Your name Gene McLean? Yeah, who are you? Police officers. These checks here. Where'd you get those? On the desk over there. You got no right to go through my things. We'll talk about that downtown. Come on, let's go. Now, look, maybe you guys made a mistake, huh? Maybe you got the wrong fella. Can't we work something out? This is a pretty good thing. There's enough for everybody. I'm sure we can make a deal, huh? No reason to act like this. Where's the press, mister? Huh? The press you print these up on, where is it? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about a press. I don't even know what you're talking about. It won't work, McLean. We got Doyle. What's he told you? All we need. Well, then he's told you where the press is, too. We're asking you about that, Mr. Well, like I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You drive a car, McLean? Yeah. Where'd you park it? On the street. No garages in this crummy place. No, that's not true, Mr. McLean. I'll keep your nose out of this. You've been spotting off too much already. That's not true, Mr. McLean. I heard everything from the hall. These officers asked me some questions, and I answered them. Police have never given me any trouble. Ten years I've been managing this place, never had no trouble before. Now you come in here and louse things no, up. Oh, turn that off. Come on, let's get out of here. Now you just wait a minute. Come in here and call this a crummy place. You did not hurt you, did you? Well, I did. Listen, officer, he's lying when he says he doesn't have a garage. He may keep his car out on the street. Maybe that part's true, but he's got a garage you just bet he has. Come on, let's get out of here. Stick around here and listen to this loony old bag. She's cracking up. Where is the garage, ma'am? I'll show you. It's just down the street. It's an old place. They rent it from the Pearsons just down the street. I'll show you. Crummy old bad, real harpy, sticking her nose in where it don't belong. Don't you talk to me like that. I don't know what it is that these officers are looking for, yeah. but I'll just bet they'll find it there. 6.27 p.m. Mrs. Holmes showed us down the street to a garage set behind a large house. The door was locked, but McLean produced the key. We went over the place, but we found nothing. 
6.55 p.m. Satisfied now? Told you there wasn't anything wrong. I told you you wouldn't find anything here. It's got to be here someplace, Joe. Yeah. How long you had this place, McLean? A couple of months. Well, we can check the owner on that. Aren't you guys ever going to give up? You maybe got me in custody, but that don't mean you're ever going to be able to prove anything. I think maybe we'll be able to. Joe. Yeah? Take a look here. On the floor. Mm Mm-hmm. Look here. See the old wooden floor and most of the nails are all rusted over. And right here, they look pretty new. Looks like the wood's been moved. Mm Mm-hmm. How about this, McLean? I don't know what you're talking about. Grab that hammer, will you, Frank, over there? Yeah, sure. Here you go. All right. Now maybe we can take a look. You guys are wasting your time. You know that, don't you? Yeah, well, it's our time. Don't you worry about it. You want to give me a hand here, Frank? Yeah. All right. You got it? I got it. All right. It's all dug out down there. Yeah. Take a look. Something down there. How about this, McLean? I don't know what you're talking about. The press, huh? Yeah. Wait a minute. A package over here. Let's see what's in it. Look, you got no right to come in here and tear up the place. I'm going to see a lawyer about this. How about it, Joe? Yeah. Printing press. Take a look. Huh. Engraver's plates. Look, here's the broken border. Yep. All right, McLean, let's go. You just wait. My lawyer's going to hear about this. Is that right? Yeah, you bet it's right. Come in here, tear up the floor. You got no warrant, you got no right. Sick of being shoved around by you guys. You haven't got any beef, McLean. I'll decide that. No, you're wrong. Huh? Man. Somebody else is going to do that. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 25th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, here are two important things to remember. Everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette, and it's the only cigarette that gives scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfields today. They're best for you. Leslie Paul Doyle and Jean Raoul McLean were tried and convicted of 10 counts of forgery. They received their sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than 14 years. Ladies and gentlemen, with long-range aircraft and atomic bombs, the enemy is only hours away from where you live. Our Air Defense Command relies on radar to detect enemy aircraft. But it is possible for low-flying planes to remain undetected. You can help defend America by volunteering for the Ground Observer Corps, a group of civilian men, women, and teenagers who report the presence and activity of aircraft. For information, write or phone your nearest civil defense center. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Art Gilmore, Whit Connor. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC.